Hello. We're now shifting our perspective from the forces between atoms and looking at the similar but greater variety of forces that can occur between molecules. The second type of bulk matter forces we'll be discussing is the intermolecular forces between molecules. There'll be five of these types of forces, dispersion forces, dipole-dipole, chain entanglement, hydrogen bonding, and ion-dipole forces. Now we'll start with the weakest of forces between molecules, and it shouldn't be a surprise that the weak dispersion or induced dipole-induced dipole forces that we saw for the atoms of the noble gas elements will also be present in electron-rich molecules as well. These dispersion forces are the dominant forces found in nonpolar molecules. Let's look at, at an example. We know that methane, CH4, is a nonpolar molecule, and the electrons in this nonpolar molecule will do just what the noble gas atoms did. They will create instantaneous dipoles, produce induced dipoles in neighboring molecules, resulting in induced dipole induced dipole interactions that bond these nonpolar molecules together. Only the most symmetric of molecules will be nonpolar. Now most molecules are polar and will have an overall electronic dipole that's fixed. An example of a polar molecule taken from a previous lecture is shown, dichlorodifluoromethane. The negative ends of this molecule will attract the positive end of a neighboring molecule, and this will continue, creating a lattice of dipole-dipole bonding interactions. These are stronger forces than the weak dispersion forces found in nonpolar systems and will take considerably more energy to break apart. The force described in this slide is not unique. It's a form of dipole-dipole interaction but I think it's different enough and common enough to put under a separate heading. The effect is called chain entanglement. Let's say we have a bag of marbles. If we shake the bag and reach in and try to grab a single marble, it's fairly easy to do so. The marbles have little to no interactions between themselves, so they don't care if we take one of their members away. Now, let's say we take a bag and fill it with paper clips. We shake it well and then reach in and try to lift out just one paper clip. We'll probably find this to be a harder task because the paper clips are long and tend to hook up with each other and get tangled together. This entanglement is a kind of bonding that forms because of the length of the paper clips and the bends and kinks along its structural backbone, forming hooks, which keep hanging up on their equally crooked and knurled neighbors. Now, if we take a long molecule like a straight chain decane, C10H22, we find that this molecule has a load of geometric structures it can be found in, and the molecule will have kinks and hooks that can easily get entangled with other decane molecules. This molecule will have more intermolecular forces holding it together in comparison to a rather small molecule like propane, C3H8, which has a more compact structure. There is a unique force that occurs with molecules that contain what is lovingly known as the fun elements. <laughs> now, these elements by themselves will have nothing amazing happen between them, but if we also include a somewhat labile or free-floating hydrogen with these elements, hydrogen bonding will start to occur. Notice, the fun elements are the highly electronegative atoms, fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen. A labile hydrogen, or anything that we would call a labile chemical part or portion of a molecule, is simply a chemical moiety or piece of a molecule that will dissociate from the whole molecule rather easily under the right conditions. Now it's critical that a labile hydrogen is bound to our fun elements and be willing to dissociate under the moderate conditions for hydrogen bonding to occur. We'll demonstrate this interesting effect with the water molecule. We know that water is polar and has a very strong dipole, with the oxygen being somewhat negative and the hydrogen side of the molecule positive. 
the static dipole attracts other water molecules with an oxygen side of another water molecule coming in contact with the hydrogens. Now oxygen is one of the fun elements with a strong electronegative pool. It turns out that when it comes in close to the hydrogens on another molecule, it will produce a pseudo bond to one of these hydrogens. At times, it will even take the hydrogen away, forming for a brief time a hydronium ion, H3O+, leaving a hydroxide OH- polyatomic ion in its place. This Bond making and strong dipole-dipole interactions are happening all over the water system resulting in strong interactions and overall a strong bonding throughout the water system. The hydrogen bonding effect is a very strong force. Other common molecules that demonstrate this hydrogen bonding are ammonia in H3 which contains the fun element nitrogen and the molecule hydrogen fluoride HF which contains our fun element fluorine. We want to mention one other intermolecular force, one that often happens with water. Again, water is a very polar molecule. Now throw an electrolyte, let's say a small amount of sodium chloride in ACL into the water. The solid disappears and we also know that the solutions will now conduct electricity proving that ions are present in the solution. Now what we have in the water is sodium cations and chloride anions distributed throughout the water. We know that the ionic bond of sodium chloride is very, very strong, yet we don't see the sodium cations and chloride anions readily finding each other and crashing back out of the solution in, into a solid state again. There must be an extremely strong force present between the water and the ions that keep the ions apart, even when we know there is a strong electrostatic force between the oppositely charged ions. The force we're describing is an ion-dipole interaction between the ion and all the dipoles of the water molecules. For a cation, the water molecule's pseudo-negative end is attracted to the positive charge of the cation. More and more water molecules will form around this highly charged ion to neutralize the effective charge of the ion, forming what is called a hydrosphere of water molecules about it. We say that this ion is now solvated, which just means that the ion is surrounded by a cage of solvent. All of that solvent around it, in effect, neutralizes the charge and creates a buffer of water molecules between it and any other ion thus minimizing its ability to attract anions. At the same time, the chloride anion is getting the same treatment, except it's being surrounded by the pseudo-positive end of the water molecules, creating a hydrosphere around itself. The two salt ions are surrounded by so many water molecules that they don't see each other again, and frankly, they don't need each other anymore. All the surrounding water has neutralized their charge. Now, we don't want to be too single-minded in our description of all these intermolecular forces. In reality, there's not just one force present in most compounds, but a wild combination of two or more of these forces working together. In water, though the dominant force would be hydrogen bonding, it most definitely would exhibit dipole-dipole forces too, since water does have a very strong static dipole. And any atom or molecule that has electrons associated with it, which would be all atoms and molecules, will fill dispersion forces between the separate entities. Now throw an electrolyte, electrolyte into that same water and you just introduced a slew of ion dipole forces into the system in addition to all the others that were already there. There is a huge amount of evidence in the form of physical properties that we can measure that can provide us with some quantitative data that demonstrate the strength of the sum of all the interactions of a compound in its bulk form. We will briefly mention some of these physical properties and the rationales to their magnitude based on the intermolecular forces that are present between the molecules. Now we'll be coming back to many of these points later as we talk further about physical processes. For solids, one type of measurement we could make to measure the strength of the interactions within a compound is to identify the temperature at which the solid melts. At the melting point, 
bonding between the chemical species is partially broken, allowing the atoms or molecules to move a bit more freely. It makes sense that the stronger the intermolecular forces between the atoms and molecules in a solid, the higher the temperature must be before it'll actually melt. Now, for liquids, we have a wide range of physical phenomena that are directly related to the strength of the interactions of the atoms and molecules. Let's list a few of these. The viscosity of a liquid is the resistance of a liquid to flow freely. We know that pancake syrup is much more viscous or has more viscosity than water. Though the molecules within the syrup are free to move around each other because of the strong intermolecular bonding that exists in the syrup, they're not as free to do this as the water molecules are. The more viscous a liquid is, the stronger the intermolecular forces that are present between the molecules in the liquid. Now, if we leave most liquids out long enough in the open air, they'll eventually disappear due to the process of evaporation. Now, what's happening is that just above the surface of the liquid, a molecule will escape and go up into the air and then wind currents will take it away before it can get back home to the liquid surface. The tendency for a molecule to evaporate is also said to be a measure of its volatility. The more volatile a molecule is, the greater its tendency to escape the surface of the liquid and get into the air. Perfumes and colognes are designed with this effect in mind. The stronger the intermolecular forces between molecules in the liquid, the less volatile the liquid is and the longer it will take for it to evaporate. Now, boiling is, a, is different than evaporation in that we're providing a liquid with enough energy for all the molecules to escape, busting through the lid of the atmospheric pressure that's keeping it down and transforming the substance out of its liquid state to a new phase of matter, the gas state. Now, it's enough for us to know for now that the stronger the intermolecular forces between molecules in the liquid state, the higher the temperature will have to be to break the bonding and boil the liquid. Now, how would we measure the intermolecular forces of a gas? We know an ideal gas obeys the kinetic molecular theory and the equation of state is PV equals nRT. The theory explicitly states that for an ideal gas, there is an absence of attractive and repulsive forces between the particles of the gas. So. If we take a known number of moles of a real gas at a known volume and temperature, it would be a simple matter to hook the gas to a pressure gauge and measure its actual pressure. Since we know the moles, volume, and temperature of the gas, we can also use PV equals nRT to calculate the pressure if there were no interactions, pretending for the moment that it's an ideal gas. Now, if the pressure we measure is different than the pressure we calculated, then the difference is, in effect, a measure of the interactions between the molecules. If the pressure is less than the pressure calculated, attractive forces are in play. And if the pressure is greater than the pressure calculated, repulsive forces are in play because the molecules are just too close. A moderate temperatures and pressures at these moderate temperatures and pressures, the stronger the intermolecular forces, the larger the differences you would expect to see when compared to the ideal PV equals nRT gas. So it should not come as a surprise that the forces that bind bulk matter dictate how chemists work and manipulate the compounds and are always having to be considered in trying to understand the chemistry of the substances. Manipulating the conditions to overcome the forces between the molecules so reactions will be more efficient or using these forces to our advantage to help us purify products are part of the chemist's trade. Well, have a terrific rest of the day or night. <laughs> Till next time.